Okay, try again. <laughs> um, so I'm here with my co-speaker, uh, Jen Ren, who's, um, we're going to talk about how we're gonna wrangle data, build models, and deploy them using Azure Machine Learning. So to kind of place this talk, because there's a lot of different AI talks uh, throughout Build, uh, we have kind of three major areas that we like to think of for our artificial intelligence services. We've got uh, AI apps and agents, so you can think of this as the bot service or the cognitive service. We've got machine learning uh, tools such as Databricks and Azure Machine Learning, and we've got uh, knowledge mining with our Azure Cognitive Search. So in this talk, we're going to specifically focus on Azure Machine Learning and how we use that to do end-to-end -end machine learning. So this talk. Anyway, this talk is a very high level, or this talk is covering a lot of ground to be able to cover the whole end-to-end -end thing. So we have detailed sessions on many of the features we're coming here, covering here. So if you want to learn more about them, you can see the other sessions on the slide that doesn't want to come up, but uh, you can also find them on the, on the website. So the idea is, you know, as I said, machine learning is really hot and there are many different activities related to machine learning and AI these days, but building models is still one of the fundamental things. So we're going to focus on what does it really mean to build models today? So if we look at it at a high level, there's really three steps. There's a step where we're going to ingest our data and prepare it and make it ready for our model and for training. Then we're going to look at building and training models. And then finally, once we have a model that we're happy with, we're going to take it and we're going to look at deploying it. So for this talk, we're going to get into more details on what that really means. But first, let me talk about Azure Machine Learning, which is what we're going to use to do this. So Azure Machine Learning is a set of services that allows us to go end to end. So this includes Azure Cloud Services, as well as a Python SDK that enables you to interact with these services through your favorite uh, notebook or IDE. And there's a cross-platform CLI. So one of the first tools we're going to use in our example here is the Azure Machine Learning Python SDK. So this enables us to, through our notebook or through our favorite editor, actually interact with all of the great um, features and services that we're showing you in Azure Machine Learning. So the great thing about this is that you can access it anywhere. Uh, it enables you to easily scale from working in your local environment to working in the cloud, and we're going to talk more about that. It allows you to integrate with many different Azure services, so you can in interact with all of them through the same SDK, and it enables you to get started quickly. Um, you don't need a lot of complex prerequisites, just a simple uh, Azure subscription. So the other thing I want to introduce, because we're using it throughout the demos, is something that uh, is new that we've just released, which are called Notebook VMs. And the idea with a Notebook VM is we're actually going to have a, a hosted Notebook VM that enables us to access our notebooks anywhere. They're already pre-configured for machine learning. It enables us to do local training on them. And it also enables us to easily collaborate with our, our um, teammates. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jen, who's going to talk about what it means to prepare data. So as we all know, preparing data is our favorite part of building a machine learning model. And of course, it's a simple one-step process, right? Well, while we're actually doing machine learning, it looks something more like this. It's this uh, highly experimental, iterative process. And what we want to do is speed up this inner loop of understanding and wrangling your data so you can build your models. So many times, just the trickiest part of starting is ingesting your data. And so this is where Azure Machine Learning data sets comes in. We want to focus on making it easy for you to get started. So what are data sets, capital D? Um, so before, in the old world, in order to build your machine learning models with data in Azure Storage, you had to get all these credentials and figure out how to access your data 
which is a highly specific way depending on what storage you're using. These are things that I, as a person trying to build a machine learning model, don't really care about. They're just means to an end. And once I've gotten that data, I have to figure out how to parse it, which seems simple in the single file case. And once you have multiple files, you need to figure out how to join them and aggregate them and coalesce them. So with data sets, we abstract away the nitty gritty parts that make it really painful. In particular, you don't need to worry about figuring out the specific credentials when you're accessing your data, just when you're registering it. And there's no need for you as the user to figure out how to manage different storage specific specifications. We handle it for you. And finally, we also offer really simple parsers for you to use to make reading in both si single file and multi file data in easily. Again, we want to, like the design principle is to abstract away the nitty gritty so you can focus on the high value task, which is building your model. And so these are sort of the design principles of how we've created data sets in Azure Machine Learning. We want to, one, help you manage your data. So you just use one artifact throughout your machine learning workflow. And then you can take that same data artifact and share it with your teammates. So as I'll show later, say I work on a data set, and then Sarah and I are on the same team trying to build an ML model. We can use the same artifact. She can reproduce my work, and that's incredibly important. And finally, we help you explore and transform your data in a very simple way. So enough talk, and let me show you how we do this. So here you can see what Sarah was describing earlier, which is the Notebooks VM uh, in Azure, the Azure portal. So here this is where I can do all of my data science work, and I pop open. Thank you. Let's try that one more time. So we can go into these notebooks. And so Sarah and I can see the same exact files. So we'll want to ingest our data first. And by the way, we'll make all of these notebooks available to all of you so you can follow, us, follow along with what we're doing and you can try this yourself. I know we promised to show you how to actually do machine learning, but this is still a talk, so we're going to load in the sample New York Taxicab data set, which a lot of us are familiar with, just to show what you can do with Azure Machine Learning. So we'll first import Azure Machine Learning SDK and get our workspace. And notice in these few lines of code, we make it very simple for you to access your uh, workspace without thinking about SAS tokens. And so now I've gotten access to this Azure Machine Learning workspace. And here, what I'm doing with two lines of code is reading in data that I have in Azure blob storage associated with this workspace. I'll want to take a peek at my data. So after we do that, it seems ready for machine learning, right? Well, I guess not, with our first line being completely full of NAs. So we'll need to do some processing. Openness and interoperability is really important to us. So at this point, you can immediately convert your data set artifact into a Pandas or Spark data frame. But we also offer an optional data preparation capability that allows you to wrangle your data right here with data sets. And it can run on many different runtimes, whether you want to execute it locally, scale up on a VM, or scale it on Spark. To do that, we'll start getting the data set definition, which is the set of lazily evaluated transformations we'll apply to our data set. Here, we want to drop um, NA strings, and so we'll do a little bit of cleaning and then rename our columns. And we'll take another peek at our data. We notice that we have this column, pick up date time, which has a ton of information in it that we could maybe use and split out as separate columns. This will help our machine learning model probably perform better. 
So here, we're applying some smart transformations that our data preparation capability offers. Rather than fussing around with regexes, what we can do is feed in an input, an example of input data, and then give it output. So you can see, uh, it'll automatically learn what transformations need to be applied to generate your new columns. So we give it the input here and two sample outputs, and then it learns how to auto-populate. And we can also e extract more information from both of these columns. In date and time, we can split it into day of the week. Um, so not only can we just split it into year, month, day, but also if I give it a date and I say, OK, we want it to understand this as this is a Sunday, semantically we can generate um, a new column, which is the week day that that date represents. And so we'll do some more split column by examples, and we can profile our data to see if it's ready. This is really helpful for me just to get a glimpse into my data set. And I notice, oops, they're all string types, which is completely not helpful for me to understand the statistical summaries of my data. So now what we can do is, one, is to manually specify what the column types are. Or I can let our data preparation capability automatically infer what the column types are. And then I can check whether those are the right types before applying it to my data set. So in this case, it seems to check out, so we'll apply it to our data set. And now we can leverage the summary statistics and profile on our data set. So this is all great, but say there's some capability in here and I maybe want to just use my own Python scripts. Again, we care so much about openness and interoperability, and here maybe I want to leverage NumPy, um, and so I can define my own Python scripts and apply it to my data set. In this case, we're taking the lat and long and converting it to XYZ coordinates. And we can also use, like, canonical visualization libraries like matplotlib. And so we want to make this really easy for you to use the toolkits that you already know with Azure Machine Learning. Once we've done that, we can look again at our summary statistics to verify that it's ready to, and we're ready to train our model. So by looking at the profile, this gives me some useful information. I immediately notice that, okay, the min in distance is zero, which doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like a data point that should be in there, so I'll filter that out. And now I can update my data set and register it to the workspace. At this point, Sarah can now use that data set for her machine learning model. So, we have a lot to cover, and we didn't even get to talk about two other things that make it really easy for you to prepare your data. In addition to Azure Machine Learning uh, data sets, we also offer Azure Open data sets that are a collected set of curated publicly available data sets that you can use with Azure Machine Learning or without, and the same thing for data preparation. So we've shown how to uh, how Azure Machine Learning makes this process much simpler by introducing tools at different points in the preparation phase. Recognizing this, um, we hope that this speeds up your inner loop so you can build models faster. So now I'll pass it to Sarah, who will take my data set and actually build the model. All right, so let's talk about the next step in the process. And uh, first of all, I think it's amazing that we can actually wrangle data live from a, a dirty data set. Uh, it's pretty exciting. And um, now we're going to go and try to uh, build and uh, train a model. So looking at this in more detail, uh, again, it's not you know, as simple as it looks. Uh, we really need to think about taking our data in, selecting the right model type, tuning the hyperparameters, and then training the model, and then we're testing it. And we might go around and around in this, uh, selecting, you know, trying different model types and tuning, and seeing if we can find a model that you know, actually works for our production needs. 
So if we kind of take a step back and look at what we're trying to do here, uh, in the case of the taxicab data set, we have a bunch of features um, which you could see in Jen's notebook, but basically to give you an idea, you know, it's things like the distance, when the ride was, the number of passengers, and our goal is to build a model that's going to enable us to predict the cost of a trip. And so we'll end up building a model that looks something like this, where we can um, actually uh, put in the different numbers and, and see you know, our accuracy improving as the model is training. So I'm going to get this started and uh, show you what this looks like. So I also have uh, the access to the same workspace here. And the great thing about uh, the workspace is it enables me to keep track of all of the different uh, artifacts that I need through my machine learning process, and also enables me to easily collaborate with people who are working uh, in different parts of the process with me. So I'm going to first, though, I, now that I have a workspace set up, I'm going to go over and I'm going to look at so I also, as Jen said, I have the same, uh, I'm, I have a notebook VM, and I have the same notebooks mounted on it that happens automatically when you create one in the workspace, which is great because it makes it easy for us to collaborate. So then I'm going to go over, and I'm going to start by building a model locally. So if I start at the top here, oops. I'm going to install some things that I need. I'm going to define my functions. I'm going to define my model here. And then I'm actually going to start by picking up that clean taxi data set that uh, Jen had made for me. And then I still need to do a little more uh, wrangling to get it into my model, but nothing uh, too major. So I can see I have the, all of the, the same columns that we saw before. I can look at the different uh, statistics um, for, for the columns and just generally understand my data set in order to help me select a model type. Right, and so here's that, you know, I can also look again at my, specifically at my data frames. And now I'm going to split it between a test and training set, or I'm going to actually separate the, the cost column. And then I'm going to look at my distribution here to just get more of a feel for my data. This is um, because of the model input, separates categorical and numerical features. So I'm actually going to split my, my data input into those two types. Let's still look at the data. And so then here, I'm actually now going to uh, split the data set into the main part of the data set that I'm going to use for training and a holdout part of the data set that I'm going to test against so that I can see how well my model is doing and uh, improve there. OK. Here's some compression on this. OK, so now I've done all of the data wrangling that I need to do. And I have my data in a training set and a validation set. So now I can look at actually defining my model and calling. Now, on a data set like this, I probably would have started with a linear model or something simpler. But um, let's say you know, we already have this in production. And so at this point, I'm really looking to play around with some more complex models and see if I can do better. So in this case, uh, today, we're going to try out a um, neural network model using PyTorch. And so here, um, I have a, a mixed input model that starts with several embedding layers and then has a linear layer and batch normalization. So you can see the, the layers here. And now I'm actually ready to train the model. So we can watch it uh, you know, training interactively here. And it actually turns out to be very fast. So uh, we have a model here. And we can look and see the, the learning curves for the model and see that uh, it is <laughs> improving over time. And then I can actually just take my model and uh, this is and write it to a file. 
And then I, the last thing I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to register my model with Azure Machine Learning so that now it's available and we can use it uh, for deployment or to compare against other models. And so I'm going to flip back to my deck here and talk a little bit more about what's going on. So as you saw in the, the version that I just showed you, we're doing a PyTorch model, um, which is one of my favorite frameworks. But what's great about uh, the tools we've built here is that we have support for many different open source frameworks. And so you can really use, as Jen was saying, your favorite tools, whether that's TensorFlow or PyTorch or Scikit-Learn. And and, it, and so you, know, you can use the one that you're the most comfortable and the most productive with and still get the advantage of the Azure cloud behind it and the resources available through the um, SDK. So the other thing that's great, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more later, is Onyx, which enables us to take all of these different frameworks and still deploy on many different backends without having to write a connection point between all of them. So uh, the version that you just saw, I was training locally on my um, notebook VM, which is great that I just have that compute there and I can use it and I can pick out the size of VM that's appropriate for my job. But maybe I want to do something bigger. Well, the great thing about Azure Machine Learning is it also enables you to interact with managed compute. So I can do distributed training where I'm going to be able to spin up a cluster and schedule jobs on this. I can distribute data. I can scale my resources accordingly. And so now I have this great managed compute for training. So if I want to do bigger jobs or mini jobs, then I, have, I can access this. And I'm not limited to my single VM or my local machine. The other thing that's great is the diversity of hardware that we have available for machine learning. Everything from you know, many different types of CPUs to uh, some of the you know, NVIDIA's greatest GPUs, and also uh, specialized FPGAs. So we have everything you can imagine from getting started very easy and having very flexible experience to you're putting this, uh, you, you care, it's a, it's a large model, and you're running it regularly, and you care about the most optimized performance. So we have the whole spectrum depending on what your needs are. And um, we have you know, new FPGA support available. The other thing we have now is uh, support for NVIDIA Rapids, which enables you to do end-to-end -end acceleration on uh, the GPUs, where you're actually going to get uh, speed up across the whole pipeline. And um, we have notebooks uh, showing this, so you can check it out yourself. So if I go back to my demo, I'm going to show this now, where I'm actually going to move over to build the same model, but instead I'm going to show what it looks like if I want to run on a remote um, cluster. So I can go over here and back to my workspace, and I can look at the compute resources I have available. And I can see that there are several VMs that you know, my teammates, we've all created and we're using as notebook VMs. But I also have uh, two different training GPU services available. One has one node, one has three nodes. Uh, so I can actually use those for training and see if it uh, speeds up my job. And so it's going to look uh, very similar to the local version here. But instead, what I'm going to do is I've moved all of the, the model training uh, and the details into a training script. Uh, here, and now I actually can submit an experiment. And I'm not sure why this is the challenge with live demos. This is also what it's like to actually do machine learning some days. <laughs> but anyway, I happen to know how to fix this one, so I can do that. And I'm going to rerun that. I'm going to submit my job again. So now I have an experiment uh, 
that's submitted. And I can also actually track it while it's running, so I can see how it's doing and if it's going to, to finish. So it's running here. It's going to you know, load up my uh, training script and everything on the GPU cluster I've selected. Uh, I've used the, <laughs> the cluster that just has one core, so you can see it's currently idle, but uh, it will show it in use um, there now that my model is actually running on it. And OK, and that's it. Now that's done. So I can do the same thing. I can register my model uh, so that it's available. So if I go back to my workspace now, I can check out what I have. If I go to experiments, I can see this experiment that I've just run. Clearly had some challenges running it. Uh, but this last one was successful, which is great. It took 26 seconds. And I can also click into it and see many more details, the logs, the files. Um, uh, any, any data that I've saved with it, uh, what, what files were specifically run so that I can go back and understand what code was used on this run and created this model. And this allows me to uh, track things as I iterate and as I move through my process and easily go back to old runs and find, those, uh, find them again if I need to. So the other thing that we can see here is if I go to models now, I have checked in a new version of the, the remote training model. And you can see it's actually keeping track of versioning. And this is the fourth version of it I've checked in. Uh, I also have the local model here. And it seems this is also the, the fourth version that I've checked in there. And so this enables me to um, now have all of the models available. And I can go and take them for deployment. So I think I will go back to the deck here. Oops. OK, so one of the great things uh, about Azure Machine Learning is that we have interfaces for all skill levels. So if you are someone that wants to use notebooks and scikit-learn, you can do that. If you need a uh, something much uh, heavier weight and you want to do the most sophisticated deep learning models, you can use TensorFlow and VS Code and still use all of the Azure machine learning interfaces. So another cool feature we have is actually for the other end of the spectrum, making it faster and easier for people to build good machine learning models. And we call this automated machine learning. And there's a talk on this at the same time right now, but uh, you can watch the video. So the idea with automated machine learning is I'm going to take a problem like, how much is this car worth? And you know, the model creation is really a time-consuming process. So as you saw, I just you know, simply made a model, but I didn't you know, iterate through different models. I didn't tune it, all of that. And so what I'd really want to do is experiment with my model architecture, my hyperparameters what features I'm selecting. And so for a simple problem like this, there could be a bunch of different combinations and that end up working the best. And so what I'm going to end up doing is picking different combinations, running a model, seeing how good the accuracy is. And I'll probably run quite a few of these and hopefully try to find the best one. So, this can take a lot of time. And I will say this is one of the great things about Azure Machine Learning, though, is that at least now, before when you were running this, you might run all of these runs. And then good luck actually finding and reproducing that you know, top 95% one when you figure out that that was the best one. And so all of the tracking features I showed you make it much easier to, once you've actually found a good model, you know, go back and reproduce it and deploy it. But uh, you know, we still have the challenge that that can take a lot of time. And if I want to get, you know, maybe I want to build a model quickly so that I can get going, or maybe the problem just doesn't need the most sophisticated data science expertise, or maybe I don't have a data scientist. But with that, I can use automated machine learning. And the idea here is we're actually going to use machine learning to do that model exploration for you. So it's going to intelligently test multiple models in parallel and then find the optimal, uh, the best model for us to output. And 
So this is great because uh, I can, with a simple command, kick this off. It'll run all of my jobs in parallel on AML compute, and then I can just get my model back and go from there. Uh, so this makes it much more accessible to, to many different people. So if we talk about training here, uh, you know, some of the key things that I talked about were managed compute, our ability to you know, either leverage AML compute and create those GPU clusters that I showed, or you can also bring your own compute and uh, enable your data scientists to, to schedule things on it in, or deploy things on it in the workspace. Um, I think one of the most important features to me is that we uh, enable you to use your favorite open source tools. The problems are hard enough without uh, requiring people to switch to a new tool chain. And so this is really about allowing people to use the language that is most productive for their problem, the tools that they're familiar with, uh, the tools that are right for your enterprise, and still enabling you to get the benefit of the cloud behind that. Um, and the last thing was, you know, briefly talking about Azure machine or automated machine learning, which enables us to uh, much uh, more quickly build decent models and, and save you um, maybe some of the initial exploration, because you can also take the model and, and tune on top of it after that. So now we get to the final step of my flow here, which is deploy. And if you know what this has looked like historically, it's, OK, the, the data scientist has some sort of Python function, and then they, I don't know, email it and say, put this in production, right? And it's, it's definitely the, the throw it over the wall method. And so I'm really excited to show you how much easier we're making it and how much more seamless for models to then be you know, packaged up and deployed on all sorts of different hardware backends. And so deploy really means uh, multiple steps as well. We're going to want to put models in an image and then deploy that model potentially on many different hardware backends. And then we constantly need to monitor the model in case uh, there's, some, there's data drift or we're seeing some sort of other issue. And perhaps I want to put in a new model or I want to roll back to a model. And so this is really a living endpoint. It's not just deployed. And it's out there. And I, I want to keep track of it and use that to decide if I'm going to you know, go back in my machine learning workflow. So I'm going to start trying to deploy models here. Let's see. OK, so I have lots of different models that I can deploy, which is great. And I'm going to try to do this live, so we're hoping that you know, it actually happens in a reasonable amount of time. But the first thing I need to do is I'm going to get a one of those models that I registered and, and get it back for deploying. So I can look here. So the nice thing also is I, I showed you the workspace. And if you like to use the workspace, you can. You can go and look at everything visually there. But you can also access all of that same information through the APIs in your notebook. So here I can also see what I told you in my workspace, which is I have a PyTorch regression, and I have a remote uh, one, and I have, um, you know, they're both at version four right now. So the first thing I need to do is I need to make a scoring file so that uh, we actually, when we call my model, we know how to, to use it for inference. So I'm going to write out my scoring file here. And then I'm going to write out my environment file. And the first thing I need to do is I want to package all of this up in a container. So we're going to get that started. And that might take a little while. So I'm going to go back and tell you a bit more about some of the different things we have to offer. So. I've been talking already about one of the key features that I think is a significant value add that is woven throughout the end-to-end -end experience is this model management experience where 
uh, as I showed you, the, you know, the first step was I created and I trained a model. And then I was able to register it. I created my scoring file with all of my different dependencies. And now I'm creating and registering an image, which then we're going to go use and deploy and monitor. And you can go around in this loop. Uh, and all of this is designed with machine learning first. So it's designed to interact in ways that are natural for machine learning people and are natural for people that are thinking about the ops details here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But as I mentioned, I think a big step up here is the fact that we have simple deployment. We have a flexible deployment that enables you to train and deploy on the cloud or on the edges, right? So I have a lot of flexibility here. I already mentioned that I can train locally. I could train on a VM. I can train on AML compute. I could train on you know, other compute that I've brought. And the same thing with deploying. You have many different options on where you want to deploy your model. And models here uh, don't have to just be the models that you've built in Azure Machine Learning. Uh, they could be cognitive service models or even models that uh, you got from somewhere else that are pre-trained that you've brought. And you can still use the deployment services with that. So in this case, as I said, you, uh, we have Azure Machine Learning. Uh, we can put things in Docker containers. And then we're going to deploy it on the cloud. And we can also deploy it to many different types of edge devices. So we're going to go back and see if my container is done. But maybe I'm talking too fast. No, I think it looks like it's still going. So I'm going to keep telling you about things, and then we'll see, see where we get to. Um, so I, as I mentioned earlier, I want to talk a little bit more about Onyx. Uh, I think that. Onyx is, you know, a, uh, it's a talk all in itself that's happening later today that you can check out. But the idea with Onyx is it's a community project that we started with Facebook and Microsoft together. And the idea was that, well, I often have a situation where I want to use one set of tools for training, and I want to use another set of tools for deploying. Or you know, maybe I want to use someone's model that they created in one framework, but my organization uses a different one in production. And so the idea is to make models more interoperable, enable us to convert models from their different formats, and then be able to run them many different places for inference. So we've created Onyx Runtime, which runs on many of the different hardware backends I have told you about in a highly performant way. So, one of the things that uh, I could do is, if I didn't want to deploy my uh, PyTorch model, but instead wanted to use the speed of Onyx runtime, I could convert my model to Onyx, and then I can run in the Onyx runtime, which is great. Uh, it enables me to, um, so that enables me to get all of the performance advantage and reach the many different uh, hardware backends that Onyx runtime supports, including. Um, uh, WinML, so if you want to run a model in Windows, you can convert it to Onyx, and then you can take that to uh, WinML. So that's one of the great paths uh, to use Azure Machine Learning and then build models for your Windows applications. OK, great. So I have a container now uh, over here. And so the next thing I need to do is now that I have a container, I want to, so I can look if I want to look if there was a log, if there was an issue, but I see that it succeeded, so I don't need to do anything here. So now really what I want to do is deploy my container. So in my notebook, I could create a new, um, a new AKS cluster, for example, in order to deploy my models. But I can go over here again, and I can go back to compute. And the good news is, in addition to the, the training um, frameworks or the training clusters that I already mentioned earlier, uh, my colleague made Kubernetes services available. So I have a CPU and a GPU one available to deploy on. So 
I can actually go back over to my notebook here, and I'm going to run this, and great, it's going to determine that I already have a cluster I can use, and so it's not going to create one, which is great. And so now what I want to do is I'm actually going to install my images on the cluster, and this potentially might also take a while, so I think we're going to go back to the slides. So another thing that's great um, is that I just made um, a basic container here, but you can also start from many different uh, base container inf in images for inference. Uh, so one of the great ones, um, talking about Onyx runtime, uh, which will be in the talk later today, is you can actually use one that's optimized for TensorRT plus Onyx and easily create it in your notebook there as a base image and run your Onyx model in a high performance way using TensorRT on your GPUs. Um, and so it makes it uh, very easy to, to get the, optim the maximum performance of your different resources and also uh, make sure that you have all the things you need in your container. And, uh, and you can reuse the same one for training as inference so you know that it works. So another uh, feature that I want to talk about that uh, I didn't show in the demo but is really helpful is uh, one of the things that you need to do in order to have your web endpoint where you're going to interact with your model is you need a schema. And one of the things we have is an automatic schema generation that can look at a single example of your input data and generate a swagger schema for you. Uh, and this also makes uh, easy integration with Excel and Power BI for your models. Let's see, this, that was exciting. OK, I'm going to see if I can show you this slide, actually. Maybe not. OK, so anyway, um, I must have a timer on it. Uh, but the idea here is, as I mentioned, the process involves many different steps. It's not as uh, you know, straightforward as just building and training and deploying. Each of these is a major step with many different people involved and many different considerations. And you're regularly looping between all of those. But one of the things that's great about this is it enables us to um, all collaborate on these different steps and easily track all of our progress along them so that we know what's going on and uh, can interact with the different artifacts as they're produced and easily go back to an old one, for example. So uh, Azure Machine Learning is a big step forward in how easy it is to go through that end-to-end -end flow collaboratively. And let's see. Oh, good. I think my, yeah. It looks like, yeah, I think it looks like my thing is done. So there's not a lot to see here. But I now have a, a cluster up. So I think if I go over here, we should see, no. OK, well, something failed, which is the challenge of, oh, well, maybe it's also challenge of live demos, but I should have a cluster up here if I didn't have uh, whatever error I had. Um, so in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to just show you, you know, simply what it would look like using the local version of my model. So if I go over here, I basically have the same scoring file that I uh, wrote out to the web service. And so it can run this initial. Uh, so I can run uh, my initialization again. This would be happening in the web service normally. Here's this input data that I'm sending as a JSON. And then now I can get back uh, you know, a very exciting result here, which is predicting the fare of that, uh, that ride. And now I can actually um, use this interactively to predict rides, uh, to predict fares for individual data points. So that's great. We actually have a model we can use. and uh, and deploy in the cloud and interact from all of these different uh, endpoints that we want to interact from. So let me go back over to the slides. 
Okay, so uh, I talked about the three steps, but I think um, it's also important to talk about some of the more end-to-end -end things. And so one of the things, um, there was a talk on this yesterday, but one of the big things that uh, Azure Machine Learning brings to the table is really thinking about enterprise readiness. And part of the enterprise readiness story is figuring out you know, what does it mean to do DevOps in the context of machine learning. So traditional DevOps is you know, a process that brings together people and processes and products to allow you to automate software delivery and provide continuous value. So this is going to be you know, continuous integration uh, and testing, continuous deployment, and also continuously learning and monitoring. So what we're doing is uh, what we call MLOps, which is really developing DevOps for machine learning. And the idea here is uh, looking deeply at the machine learning process and designing a process that makes sense for machine learning but still enables all of the DevOps considerations that we need. So if you think about it, uh, you know, one, the sort of the dev part of the cycle here is we're experimenting, we're developing new models, and uh, what we're adding with MLOps is the you know, continuous integration testing, continuous deployment, um, feedback, uh, and you know, data feedback so you can build better models and also understand how well your model is doing. And so the goal of this um, really turns into kind of uh, I like to think of it as three high-level goals. And so one of them is uh, the thing that I've already been emphasizing, which is producing repeatable experiments. This is uh, essential in being able to go back and debug and understand what's going on. Um, it's, you know, in machine learning, this is often even more challenging than with traditional software, since the models are statistical and uh, it can be difficult to reproduce bugs. And so the more we can do by having repeatable experiments, the, the better it is. Uh, I already talked about managing the model lifecycle and having different versions, files, dependencies, all of that as a model goes from just a data set to an experiment to a model to uh, something deployed on a cluster in production. And the other big thing, if we're really going to automate uh, the process and enable us to get faster, more continuous value, we have to complete the circle, right? Going from what we've done here, data and features and model, to services, to predictions, and then taking that data as the services are running and putting it back into helping us make better models and understand our users or our application better and improve the service and learn over time. So if we look at it, we have these steps that I showed you where I'm training and testing and registering my model. And the DevOps loop, or MLOps, really uh, is also about adding features that enables this to be much more automated and uh, done programmatically and at scale. So one of the features that's great for this uh, is Azure Machine Learning Pipelines. And what the pipelines do is enable us to do all of the steps that I, we've been doing manually and say, OK, well, it turns out I want to repeat that step. I'm going to get new data, and I'm going to be constantly rebuilding this model. I can turn it into a pipeline where all of this is going to happen automatically for me based on new data coming in or someone starting it. And so uh, what's great about this is we can have you know, reusability of pipelines. Uh, if I showed you in the workspace, there's also all of my pipelines are tracked. Uh, you can use different types of compute. And, you know, you have unattended runs, so you can run many different runs in parallel. You can uh, trigger them appropriately. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, the, the details of managing the model lifecycle, so there's many different pieces there. Uh, and we're actually enabled to automate many of these different steps of the life cycle in a CI, CD way. So one of the ways to do that also is to use the Azure DevOps pipelines to automate the, the deployment pieces. Uh, and you can use all of those great features. So 
our ML ops, as I said, it's really uh, you know, a, a story that involves many different parts of the process, and it's built on uh, many different technologies built in Azure, technologies that we've built custom for the DevOps story, and you know, features we've built into Azure Machine Learning as it is. So I think you know, to summarize here, uh, Azure Machine Learning enables us to do end-to-end -end machine learning uh, at many different levels whether, of expertise, whether you want to start with pre-trained models and reduce your time to market, whether you want to use your favorite data science tools, if you want to do hardcore deep learning, uh, all of the popular frameworks are available. And then you have productive services and powerful infrastructure underneath that to make sure that you're never limited by your compute resources or training time, but you can access the full power of Azure. So, well, <laughs> there are some slides that doesn't, don't want to be shown. But anyway, so uh, we decided, you know, what would be nice here is to emphasize the point that what the process really looks like to have uh, one of our great customers and partners come up and talk more about how they're using Azure Machine Learning in their company. So uh, with us, we have Jason Lee, who is the CTO of Pinland, and he's going to tell us about what they've built on Azure Machine Learning. Thank you, Zara. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Lee, and uh, currently I'm the uh, co-founder and also CTO of Pinland Data Technology Company lo located in China. Um, Pinline has its core uh, product called Pinshi, uh, which uses the uh, AI technology to bring the product recognition engine to the customers. And also our goal is to bring our product recognition ability to everywhere on this planet. So today I'm going to show you our solution case uh, cooperated with Shangqi Anji Logistics, uh, who is the number one auto part uh, logistics company in China with 70% market share. So uh, now let me show you our scenario and also the solution of this, uh, of, of this part. So our scenario is uh, basically based on, based on the inventory checking, which is highly needed for uh, the warehouse. And in the past, the uh, inventory checking costs very highly human efforts. Uh, commonly, it costs seven, uh, hundreds of workers to do uh, seven times 24 hours for one inventory checking. So, in the, uh, so as a result, it, it brings our uh, to a low efficiency and also time cost. So right now, we bring our solution, which brings us together with the computer vision technology and also the auto-driving vehicle uh, in the warehouse. So our aim of this solution is to improve the efficiency and also improve the human resources. So finally, we achieved the goal, of finally goal, which uh, finally boosted the efficiency from one minute per pen to 10 seconds per pen for the inventory checking, and also improve the human resources uh, from 10% to 90% per warehouse. So this is the about the scenario and also the solution. Uh, right now, let me show you two videos and also the demos. Uh, you can see on the left, it is the original human check. That is, uh, the warehouse is always doing in their uh, inventory checking. So there is a worker that is uh, driving the forklift to move the pan from the second shelf to the ground. And the worker also has to bring a device, a hand-on hand device to uh, scan the QR code on each bucket in this pan to gather the information of the uh, products. Yeah, you can see he is using the device to scan every QR code on uh, this bucket. So it is very, uh, cost very highly human efforts and also uh, time cost in this scenario. So on the right side, we bring our robotic auto check system and also our solution, which uses the uh, object detection uh, algorithms and also using the auto driving uh, forklift to do the automatically inventory checking. So. Play the second video. Yeah, you can see we are just using the cameras on the lift fork to uh, automatically, do, automatically do the checking uh, for the workers instead of just using 
uh, the handheld devices to scan the QR codes. So this is our final solution. And finally, I will bring you our uh, technical architecture here. Uh, this is how we integrate the HR machine learning to our solution and also our backend. So first, we really benefit much from the Azure machine learning managed data scientist workflow, uh, which can highly simplify our algorithm engineering to train their models and also gather the data and upload the data to the cloud. And second, we, you, with the help of the Azure machine learning API, we can simplify our backend developments. So we can, the backend developers just use one single line of code to uh, do the like the model management or the data management. And I will show you our clients later. So uh, next, we are still uh, benefit from the computing so resources from the Azure machine learning platform, such as the GPU, which is used to train the models and also the deep learning models, and also the CPU to run our backend. And finally, uh, we use the Azure IoT Edge to deploy our model from the cloud to the local machine. OK, so uh, finally, I will show you our clients for this solution. So uh, here you can see there are two main parts of this clients. <coughs> the first part is called the ma model management. So it corresponds to a single line of code of, uh, in our Azure machine learning platform, which manage the models, the training models, and also the deployed models here. And also the, there, are, there is a data management page here, which corresponds to our uh, data upload and also the data uh, cleaning jobs, which it was introduced by Jane previously. So this is our final uh, solution and also our uh, product and the client for the customer. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Great. So um, I hope that this has you know, got you interested in trying it out yourself. So. Uh, if you want to learn more, we, of course, have um, free trials on Azure where you can go and check all of this out. Uh, there's documentation. And uh, you can also give us feedback or ask for features. Let us know what you think. Um, you know, this is a very new and evolving product, so we love to hear you know, what you really need and, um, and how we can advance things. So uh, feedback is a really great thing. And uh, yeah, we're hoping that you'll check it out and that this helped you understand a little bit more some of the, the detailed mechanics in building machine learning models. Uh, so thank you all for your time. And I guess we have a few minutes for questions. <laughs>